listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Hello, everyone. Thank you for spending some time with us this evening. It's a happy Thursday, and I am being supervised. Closely, apparently. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes I need it. <laughs> oh, my. Um, <laughs> just want to remind you, if you like what you hear, the share buttons, the like buttons, all those good things, you know, they, they help everybody else hear what you're hearing, too. It just makes it easier for people to find us. Doesn't cost you anything. Doesn't gain us anything. But it might help spread some, at least some of the word of the creator. <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's the shortest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Yes. Actually, oh, <laughs> they're all still 24 hours, but you get the, the least amount of sunlight in the Northern Hemisphere. Um <laughs> I get excited right now because that means it's going to start getting light for longer. It's going to be working back to the light. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the proper side of the sun now, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, if you haven't been to givegodnani.com lately, you might want to check that out. Um It's it's not necessarily a, an insider private joke. It's just something that I've teased my about for years because in the wintertime, she's always been cold. And it doesn't matter what the temperature is. It can be 90 degrees and she's cold. 90 degrees Fahrenheit and she's cold. Well, I tell her it's because we're on this side of the sun now and it's colder on this side of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I, I make any type of reference to that, I get the stinky. Men, you know the look. <laughs> Trust me, you know the look. If you're married, you know the look. <clears throat> uh, if you're new here, we like to have fun too. Okay, <laughs> just just saying. <laughs> oh goodness, I'm going to start tonight in Proverbs 29, verse two. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, if you know history at all, your mind probably goes to Hitler, right? And how he persecuted the Jews and say, oh, those poor Jews, they were, you know, they were so mournful. They were so persecuted. It wasn't just the Jewish people who were mourning when Hitler was in power. Uh, I happened to have met a fellow a few, well, a number of years ago now. He was a member of the Hitler Youth in Germany. Uh, he turned 17 and was drafted into the German army. And his life was miserable. And he, he was a good Nazi at the time. Um, Hated every minute of it. Didn't like what Hitler stood for. Didn't like what was going on, but had to be part of it. In fact, after uh, he had been wounded and, and as his, his wounds were healing near the, the very end of the war, uh, he got on a train. He said, I didn't care what border it was going to. He was leaving Germany. Everybody was miserable, unless you were a member of the elite. And, and history has proven to us over and over that, that the words that Solomon wrote are true. When righteous people are in power, they treat people fairly. They're, everyone seems to be in a much better mood, right? But when evil people are in power, everybody's they just spread the misery the misery 
Everybody's miserable. You know, how often through history do we see evil men and women causing pain, death, destruction for everybody? Now think about that. When evil people influence others, it causes trouble for everyone. And and there are a lot of warnings in the Bible about staying silent in the face of evil. Leviticus 5 tells us it's a sin, you know, if you're called to testify and you don't testify in a public hearing, it's a sin because you're not standing up to evil. And then uh, we read passages like this one in Isaiah. Go ahead and read that. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a ram's horn. Declare to my people their transgressions and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways like a nation that does what is right and does not forsake the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgment. They delight in the nearness of God, Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. Yeah, so it says, cry out loud, shout, raise your voice like a ram's horn. Make it known. But we must do that carefully because <laughs> we need to be very wise uh, and know when to speak where to speak, and probably most importantly, how to speak. Okay? I'm just, I, I, I want to make sure that you understand that you, you need to be, you need to show some wisdom. You need to be wise with it. You need to know when, where, and most importantly, how. How do you deliver the correct message? And there's a couple of passages that talk about that. Go ahead and read those. For I know that your transgressions are many and your sins are numerous. You oppress the righteous by taking bribes. You deprive the poor of justice in the gate. Therefore, the prudent keep silent in such times, for the days are evil. Amos chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Proverbs ten nineteen. A time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7. So... <laughs> Again, when evil's in power, you have to be careful. You, you don't stop sin the more you say. You stop sin the way you say it and with what you say. I should say how you speak with what you are given to speak. There's a time to speak, a time to just kind of hold back and see what's going on. Knowing when, where, and how to speak in order to promote good and to destroy evil, it, you know, it can be kind of a tricky thing, right? Because it's going to be different for every in event we encounter. Now, the issue that we face um, is not telling people what, you know, to do what's right. That, that's not what we're here for. We don't we, we can't say you have to do what's right and expect it to be done. That that's nobody's gonna take your advice on that. It's just not typically going to work. The issue we face is with being able to offer information. And the information that we should be offering are the words that have already been spoken by our Creator. And that can sometimes be a frightening thing. 
you know, most of the biblical prophets were murdered simply for speaking the words that the Creator gave them to speak. Many of the disciples met a pretty dreadful death as well. But we're going to look at a couple of passages and, and see what happens when an entire fellowship fails to heed the warnings about speaking out and standing up for the words of the Creator. <clears throat> but I have a few things against you, because some of you hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block before the Israelites so they would eat food sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. In the same way, some of you also hold the teaching of the Nic- Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. Otherwise, I will come to you shortly and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelations 2, verse, 16, verse 14 through 16. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants to be sexually immoral and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Even though I have given her time to repent of her immorality, she is unwilling. Revelations chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, yet you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have found your deeds incomplete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know the hour when I will come upon you. Revelations chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The warning to the churches that Paul had established are clear. In fact, each of the letters contain the same components, an accusation, a warning, and a solution. Now, each of these fellowships Paul began by visiting the Jewish communities where he went. So most of these people uh, would have had a connection to the instructions or to the law, if you want to call it that. The, The problem these folks faced is that they were surrounded by a pagan culture, and many of them adapted to that in some fashion. As the fellowships grew, there were some who had accepted the Creator, but they refused to give up their useless useless con, uh, traditions. They they basically continued to to create a hybrid of their own. They they wanted to follow the instructions, but they wanted to follow their pagan practices at the same time. Yeah, there, there was a great deal of what's called sexual immorality. Um, and other places had other problems. Now, there's a very important lesson that we should learn from these warnings. It's not just for Christians. I know a lot of Jewish communities today who have people, and they have caused a lot of turmoil in those communities. So when I use these letters, don't think that they're only for the Christian churches. Although there are probably many more Christian churches that seem to be persuaded to sin in in different ways than the Jewish synagogue communities. But they both have their own individual issues that they have to deal with. (laughs) No, I'm not going to go there. If I have time, I'll go there later. Um, The only thing necessary for for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That quote is attributed to Edmund Burke. You know, Google it. It's that's who comes up with it. But there's an address made to the University of Saint Andrews by a man named John Mill. And John Mill said this, and I quote, Let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion 
that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. He is not a good man who, without a protest, allows wrong to be committed in his name and with the means which he helps to supply, because he will not trouble himself to use his mind on the subject. In other words, if we're talking about a worship community, if you don't hold accountable those who would bring sin into the fellowship, you are allowing sin to win. And sadly, that's exactly what's happening in many churches today. Their lust for money has replaced teaching of the word of the Creator. And if you think I'm wrong, look at how the churches are spending their money and look at where that money's going. Just, just follow the money. Now, Jewish synagogues have a slightly different issue. They want people to attend and hear, but there are a lot of them that have capitulated to those who would defile the words they're hearing. So the warnings in the letters of Revelation are not just for Christians. Quite honestly, the, the Jewish folks have been given these warnings in a lot of places other than Revelation. Read your prophets. When, when we deviate from the sacred word of the Creator, we sin. And if you don't speak out and hold the ones accountable that are bringing that, you are also guilty of sin. <clears throat> Believers have somehow convinced themselves, if I just keep quiet, things will change. Well, if you just keep quiet, things are going to change. They're going to get continually worse. I have seen it happen. I've spoken out. I've been persecuted by a church for saying we shouldn't do what's in the doctrine. We should do what's in the Bible. That's what I was persecuted for. Laughed at, mocked, told, I'm too young to know how things are done. Hmm. I'm not that young anymore. I wasn't that young then either. But the church, that particular church today is in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. You know what, I'm going to hold what used to be the United Methodist Church up as an example for this. Nobody, at least in the United States, wanted, you know, <laughs> wanted to say the path you're going down is the wrong path. Today, it is the un-United Methodist Church. It is divided in many, many ways. Now, to go along with what I'm talking about, <clears throat> I want to address something here. And, and it's almost become a battle cry among some Christian churches. And it, it is the consideration uh, of the church going underground. Hiding out, waiting for something. <laughs> for some churches, that might not be a bad idea. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it. For some churches, it might be a good idea for them to go underground because they need to be buried. 
just cover them up, let them fester in their own sin where they can't reach out and harm anybody else. Sadly, that's what needs to happen to some of them. But for the churches that are trying, for the the churches that have listened to the warnings, they've repented, they're following the path, the last place they need to be is somewhere no one can find them. No one lights a light and then hides it. That's what Yeshua, that's what Jesus said, right? Why would you want to make it more difficult for the people who really need you to find you? Now, the legend is that the early church was persecuted, and to some degree, it was. The reality is, the early followers of Yeshua, the early followers of Jesus, were not persecuted nearly to the extent that the Jewish community would be later and continues to be today. Yes, I know that Paul went around killing Christians. However, if you look carefully at history, you're going to find out that was very, very few and far between. The, the people who were considered the early Christians began to follow, follow the teachings of Yeshua, Jesus, were in fact trying to convince their fellow Jews to return to the law of Moses and don't worry about the tradition of the Pharisees. And that's what got the Pharisees so upset. They were losing their power. They were losing their control over the people. It, it's the same reason the Christian church today is so disgruntled with those who are waking up and holding pastors accountable when they fail to call sin what it is, when they preach from the pulpit something that contradicts directly with Scripture. Churches are upset with that. Same reason Christian churches are upset with you know these little Bible study groups. You know They encourage small groups, and when they actually get together and study the Bible, and they realize, wait a minute, the, the doctrine of the church we're members of conflicts with Scripture? Hmm. Churches get upset, and they, they want to break up these little groups. You see, <laughs> when we don't take the warnings that are in the Bible seriously about mixing the holy with the unholy, we will face the consequences. And these small groups are figuring this out. When we're silent, when we should be speaking, we face the consequences. And unfortunately, sometimes when we speak, we face consequences too. The church says, oh, we don't like you doing this anymore, so we're no longer going to let anybody take part in these small Bible study groups. The church doesn't have that authority. If you're in one and the church is giving you a hard time, they can't tell you to stop. They can ask you not to to no longer attend the worship services, but they can't tell you to stop getting together to study the Bible. <laughs> and and yes, I have heard of churches trying to do that. <laughs> kind of silly in a way. Here's a church telling people that they can't gather to study the Bible that the church is supposed to be representing. Does that really make any sense to anybody? Well, I guess it would if your job's in jeopardy, your paycheck's in jeopardy, and these folks might start to stir up enough trouble to get you kicked out of your position. Hmm. Maybe more small study groups need to be stirring up some trouble in the churches. Just saying, not telling you to do it, just giving you something to think about. 
you know, I, I often have to think that our creator uh, will allow the, the people who refuse to, re, uh, re, they, they refuse to reject their useless traditions. They refuse to reject the doctrines that conflict with the Bible. And it's not so much as a test for us, but an opportunity for us to display our faith by actually saying something. You know, somebody wants to come in and it, it doesn't matter whether they want the church to sponsor a drag queen event or they want the church to uh, sponsor, uh, pick your poison, pick a sin. What's your favorite one, right? We want to sponsor this particular event that conflicts with the Bible. And the church says, okay. And you stand up and say, this isn't right. It's your opportunity to, to display your faith. It's your opportunity to be heard in a public hearing. It's your opportunity to stand on the sacred word and say, this is going to make God mad. And you need to be very, very careful where you tread on this. You see, a well-placed word can be equally effective as the handwriting on the wall. If you're not comfortable, if you're not told to stand up when there's a church meeting and say it, go to whoever you're told to go to. A well-placed word can be equally effective as the handwriting on the wall. <clears throat> In Proverbs 17, we read, a man of knowledge restrains his words, and a man of understanding maintains a calm spirit. Even a fool is considered wise if he keeps silent and discerning when he holds his tongue. There is a time to be silent, and there is a time to speak. There's a time to take action. There's a time to be patient. But when it's time to speak or to act and we don't do it, evil will prevail. When we do nothing in the face of evil, we help evil win. And if you're confused, that's called a sin. Now, if you're not given the words, don't say something foolish. I can still hear, um, oh, Liberty College guy. Oral Roberts? No, not Oral Roberts. Jerry Falwell. Yeah. Jerry, I can still hear Jerry Falwell. It's not Adam and Eve. It's Ad, it's not Adam and Steve. It's Adam and Eve. That was foolish. He was not given those words to speak. He chose those words to speak. If you're not given the words, don't enter the battle but if you're given the ammunition use it wisely if you want things to change for the glory the honor and the majesty of the almighty don't allow his words to be held back if you're given something to say say it to who the person or the people that you're supposed to speak it to. It's time for many Christian fellowships, many Jewish folks to repent, turn back to his way, or they will face the consequences. It's that simple. If you don't speak up when you're given the words... You're helping evil win. What will you say on Judgment Day when that happens? Yeah, I know you might be a member of a very nice worship community. I'm sure they're wonderful people. The folks that 
we were part of. We're wonderful people individually, but collectively, eh, not so much. <laughs> You've got to say something. When it conflicts with the Bible, got to say something but at the same time you've got to be wise and you've got to say it properly you know don't go I got to be careful how I say this there are people who are so adamant about abortion they go blow up abortion centers or burn down abortion centers That's not being wise. You don't want to create more of a conflict than you're trying to resolve. Did I say that right? Okay. You have to be able to be calm, rational, and speak the words you are given because when you're given the words, they don't have to make sense to you. They're going to make sense to somebody. You know, do you think Jeremiah or Isaiah or Amos or any of the prophets, you, know, you want me to say, I can, I can hear the, the thoughts in their head. You want me to say what? But the job of a prophet is to speak what they're given. Our job is to stand on those words that have already been spoken because they are sufficient. And if you're given those words, speak them to the people that you are supposed to speak them to. And that's what you can think about until Monday. Oh, wait. Monday's a holiday, isn't it? Hmm. Okay, think about... No, Sunday's the holiday. Monday. Monday? Yes. I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> anyway, think about them until next time. That's it. Until next time. <laughs> and until then, we wish you many, many blessings, Yes, everyone. everybody. Be blessed. Thank you.